I am currently a stay-at-home mom with my daughter, Savannah. I am also a full-time college student. It is hard to juggle both sometimes, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. My name is Leah, and I am a Miraculous Mama. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Miraculous Mamas podcast. I am your host, Elizabeth Joy, and we are so glad that you are here. Miraculous Mamas is a podcast that believes in empowering women through storytelling and education. And lately, we have been getting our education on. This is Movember. It is Men's Health Awareness, Fertility Month. So much is happening in November and we are bringing on experts and inventors and innovators and so many cool people this month to teach us what we need to know and how to better ourselves, better our uh, sperm health. If you guys listened last week, it was an episode dedicated to sperm health and I am so glad that there are Brianna's and Rochelle's in the world who are creating conversations around this and inventing a male prenatal. I mean, come on. When I heard about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this? I was so intrigued. And then I ordered the product, got to looking at their um, their brand and what they represent. And I just had to bring them on. And today I'm so excited to talk about the other side of it, about women. We're going to be talking about um, conceiving, birth control, all sorts of stuff with an amazing guest. And I cannot wait for you to hear from her. And I'm just so excited for what this month holds for us. We have Dr. Axe coming on this month. And we're also having a story from one of our listeners for premature prematurity awareness as well. Before I bring the guest on, uh, if you guys are not subscribed to the podcast, go ahead and hit that subscription button. Uh, It helps keep you up to date whenever we release episodes, bonus episodes, and all of that. And if you are not following the Instagram, the Twitter, or a a part of our Miraculous Mamas Facebook community, you're definitely going to want to join there. It is an awesome place just to be in community with like-minded people, like-minded women, and to get advice and to feel heard and validated and know that you are not on this journey alone. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get Lindsay on and I'm so excited to dive into all the topics that she is bringing today. All right, everyone, I have Lindsay Mizell here and she is the AVA Chief Science Editor and she's a total badass woman and she has so much information to offer us. By now, I know Most of you, if not all of you, have heard about the AVA bracelet, and it's an amazing company. But in order to have a company like that, you have to research female bodies, how they operate, what to look for, how to track different things. So there's so much information and knowledge that goes into it. And Lindsay is like the human form of that knowledge. (laughs) So we're so glad that she's here because we're going to talk about birth control, what to expect coming off of it, myths about fertility, because there's so much misinformation out there or just lack of information out there. Um, And then we're going to touch on miscarriages just a little bit. So thank you so much, Lindsay, for taking the time to come on and chat with me. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. All right. So I'm just going to have you kind of tell us a little bit of what you do and, and how you got there. Um, Yeah, so my background is as a writer and journalist, mostly in science and tech. And when I started working at Ava around four years ago, I actually um, I had a very basic knowledge of the menstrual cycle. I don't think I I knew about as much as anyone any any average woman. Um, now I don't even remember what that's like because my job for the past four years has been to uncover you know every every myth, dispel every myth, and uncover every important fact about female reproductive health and translate it in a way that is both easy to understand, but, um, but captures the real nuance of, of, of what's truly going on. Um, I think my, my motto when I'm working on Ava World is just to remember that I think my audience is very smart and can handle the real information. And they may not want to read the actual clinical study, but they want to know what it really says. Um, and while I um, so I, I had a baby about a year and a half ago. So a lot of the time that I was putting this content together, I was a woman who was actively trying to get pregnant and going through a miscarriage myself. And so that was a, a great guide for me to to know what topics would be interesting to that population because I was in it. And it was great to have my job be to get paid for all of the things I'd be obsessively Googling all day anyway. 
<laughs> yes, that that's very true. And I know like going through it, you it does. It gives you a completely different perspective as well and probably even deepen that desire for you to want to understand what's happening. I think that, and it's also very humbling because I, um, you know, like one example is I, I remember before I was trying to get pregnant, writing a lot of content around what's the right time to take a pregnancy test. Don't take it before, you know, this point, because there's absolutely no way you'll get a positive. Um, and I definitely was the person who took the pregnancy <laughs> test too early. <laughs> So, I mean, when is the right time? <laughs> ah, good. Well, it, it depends. But so a lot of people think of the beginning of pregnancy as conception. Mm-hmm. But interestingly, um, it really should be considered implantation. There was one study that found that if you have unprotected sex and there's viable sperm and you ovulate, pretty much almost almost all of the time conception will happen. It's not a rare or special event, but only a small fraction of those conceptions uh, the fertilized eggs will be fit enough to successfully implant. Hmm. And so implantation happens most commonly nine days after ovulation. For most women, that's four or five days before their period is due. Um, and so it takes around 24 hours after implantation happens to have enough HCG, that's the pregnancy hormone, um, to build up in your system that a pregnancy test can detect it. So I would say the absolute earliest that you should test is nine or 10 days after ovulation or like three or four days before your period is due. And really, if you want to make sure that you won't get a negative result if you're truly pregnant, 12 days is the best day, 12 days after you ovulate or around two days before your period is due. Yeah. Wow. That is so interesting. Um, I actually didn't know that either. (laughs) It is that time of year where everyone is traveling or running around getting thoughtful gifts for the people that you care about, but maybe think about giving yourself the gift of an Audible membership. Now is the best time to do it with a special offer of 53% off your first three months. You can access an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, including bestsellers, motivation, mysteries, thrillers, and so many more. You can choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two exclusive Audible originals that you can't hear anywhere else. And you can listen on any device, anytime, anywhere with the Audible app. One feature that I think is really cool is that you can share a book from your library with anyone. And if it's their first time accepting an audiobook through this feature, they can listen for free. You can also share audio experts from your favorite listens with anyone. How cool is that? And right now, for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half of the regular price. Choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash mamas or text mamas to 500-500. That's audible.com slash mamas or text mamas to 500, 500 for three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. So I'm so excited to dive into kind of the myths and misconceptions, um, you know, because there's, I mean, you just even were talking about one, like a lot of people think this, but this is actually what happens. Um, so talking about like myths, myths and misconceptions about fertility and conceiving, um, can you, can you kind of touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I have my, my favorite myths and misconceptions that I can go into, um, So a really big one is I think that there's, when you're trying to get pregnant, there's way too much focus on the day that you ovulate. Mm -hmm. Uh, The fertile window is six days long. It's the five days before you ovulate and the day of ovulation. And ovulation day is actually not the best day to get pregnant. It's the three days leading up to ovulation that you have the highest chances of conceiving. Those are all better than the day of ovulation itself. So you really when you're trying to time having sex around, um, you know, your fertile window, your, your goal is not to like time it exactly on when you ovulate. And in fact, um, the reason why the chances of getting pregnant on the day of ovulation are lower is because you have a higher chance of having an early miscarriage from sex on ovulation day. And I think uh, there's not, they don't really totally know why that is, but they think it might have something to do with um, the, the egg has already aged a little bit by the time the sperm get there and the sperm have to go through this process called capacitation, which means they kind of have to just get ready and comfortable in your reproductive tract before they're really able to fertilize the egg. So it's, it's really best that the sperm is there waiting mm-hmm. before you ovulate. 
Um, so that's one misconception, which kind of leads me to the other. My, this is like my big pet peeve is how um, ovulation tests are used. A lot of women yeah. use ovulation tests when they're trying to get pregnant, but there's a lot of misunderstanding of what they actually tell you. So th- they tell you, usually for most women, if you get a positive ovulation test, that means that you're about 24 hours away from ovulation. Um, but that, so if you're waiting to have intercourse until you see that, that means that your best days to get pregnant, some of them could be already behind you. Mm-hmm. So I think w- women kind of inadvertently lower their chances by, by relying too much on the, those kinds of uh, indicators. Yeah. And and something that I've recently learned is how smart um, our bodies are in the cervical mucus and how you're talking about like that six day window, because I was always taught that sperm can only stay alive for um, 72 hours for like up to three days. But that's actually not fully true because um, like your vagina is naturally acidic. So when you're not ovulating, it'll kill off sperm. But when you are, it creates that home for them. And like you said, it's kind of better if they're in there and waiting. And then on your ovulation day, that it's the sperm that's already in in your body that that makes a better chance for conception. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the more I learn about cervical mucus, the more I'm like, this is just something that every woman should know and understand Mm -hmm. and track. And the studies actually show that it's not, I mean, I think we often think of cervical mucus as this kind of vague, not very clear, hippy dippy thing, but studies show that it's it's a highly accurate way of predicting when, uh, or detecting when your most fertile days are. It's also, um, it's, it's a direct indicator of what your estrogen levels are because the thing that causes your cervical mucus to change in quality is your estrogen levels. So you can literally look at your cervical mucus and you can say, oh, my estrogen levels are going up because I see these changes in my cervical mucus, which I think is really cool. Wow. I didn't know that either. And I know that I overproduce estrogen. I'm very estrogen dominant in my system. Well, perhaps you would see that in your cervical mucus. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can totally tell like when when that's happening. But it's also, I always believed, which is not true either, that when that cervical mucus changed, that's when I was ovulating. But that actually isn't my exact ovulation day. As you're saying, it's those days before. And by your ovulation day, you're usually not really having that much mucus. Is that correct? I think it actually varies depending on the woman. But what they find is that, so so there's all these studies that look at how many days relative to ovulation, like like which day relative to ovulation are you most fertile? And it's like kind of like, oh, is the holy grail, is it two days before? Is it one day before? Is it the day of? And then there's some others. And, and th- those studies find that's when I, I was referring to that earlier when I said the three days before ovulation are the best. But then there's this other way of looking at it that says, hmm, maybe actually the best day is the day when you have the best cervical mucus. Mm-hmm. And for some women, that might be one day before. For other women, that might be two days before. And so really cervical mucus is just a great guide and it, it tells you like, you know, when your personal best day might be. And that's, that matters more than how many days before ovulation it is. Yeah. So it kind of goes back to, I mean, you see this in tons of different industries out there, this one size fits all formula, like everyone should do this diet, everyone should do this thing. And you see the same for fertility and tracking your ovulation. There's so much information out there saying, you ovulate on day 14 or you ovulate between this day and this day and that's when you should have sex. Whereas again, it's not necessarily on your ovulation day and it's figuring out yourself, your body, getting to know yourself in your body and when you're ovulating. And it's kind of this, you know, formula that you have to figure out for yourself. But then that also means that that takes time to figure that out for yourself, to figure out your cycle, when you're ovulating, when the best time for you is. And there's so many people who are like, hey, I'm going to get off birth control because we're ready to have a baby right now. And they're getting off a hormonal birth control and then it's not happening right away. And you see that so much out there because there's not a tons, of, there's not enough information about how conception actually works. It really is shocking to me that this isn't the basic thing that everyone learns in sex ed. Because what I've heard from probably hundreds of women is that, you know, when you finally want something from your body, from your fertility to get pregnant, and then you learn about this, you're like, whoa, why did I wait until I wanted something from you? This was like just great information that I should have known when I started getting my period. And so, yes, I I agree. That's that's definitely the case. Yeah. I I mean, I think it's pretty mind blowing because even for me, so I've... I don't work 
I guess I, I'm a birth doula, so I work with women having babies, but not necessarily on the conception end, which I'm starting to get a lot more passionate about because I'm seeing so much of the lack of education or information that's out there. And then the heartbreak that people are experiencing when it's been six months and they've been trying and they're not getting pregnant because nobody told them it might take their body time to normalize and have a healthy cycle back after birth control, or it might take a while for you to figure out when you're actually ovulating if you haven't been or like any of these things getting under control and where you think, oh, my body's just the problem. And it's like, no, you, you have to get to know your body and understand how it's going to work for you. Yeah. It's like learning a new language. And I think women are often intimidated by the prospect of learning how to track their fertility and there's a learning curve for it and it can be confusing in the beginning but once you know how then that knowledge stays with you for your life and you're able to really understand what's going on in lots of different situations yeah yeah absolutely the holidays are just around the corner and there's one gift that thousands of moms have been calling the best gift ever and i've been wondering what to get my mom and why not a gift that keeps on giving new memories? For a really special gift for the special people in your life, you've got to check out the Skylight Frame. The Skylight Frame is a touchscreen photo frame that you can update instantly by email, anything from anywhere. So you can get one for your mom and then give access to all your siblings so they can send in photos of the grandkids and it'll update daily. When you send those photos in, they are uploaded in under 60 seconds and your mom can see the pictures of the trip that you're on or the play that she couldn't be at or whatever it may be. It is so cool. It has a black frame and a white mat. So it looks like a real photo frame and it adds a beautiful touch in your home. The skylight frame has a gorgeous 10 inch touch screen and you can swipe through the photos with your finger and even tap to thank the person who sent you the photo. It's 100% satisfaction guaranteed. And if you don't love the skylight, they'll offer you a full refund. You can preload it with your favorite photos for a personalized card and tens of thousands of families use skylight to stay connected. When I heard about the skylight frame, I was thinking, what an amazing idea. So me and my siblings live, there's four of us, and we all live in four different states. And so my mom isn't able to be with all of her grandkids and her kids. But how cool is it that we can all send in photos to the frame that she has set up in her home, and she can get to see what the kids are up to that day, uh, what her grandkids are doing. And it is such a nice way to stay in touch and just instantly get a photo of somebody who is thousands of miles away. I think it's such an amazing idea and an awesome gift. Now, as a special offer for you guys, you can get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter code MAMA. That's right. To get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame, just go to skylightframe.com and enter code MAMA. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E.com, promo code MAMA. So, um... How do you feel about the pull-out method? Um, So the pull-out method um, is actually... So um, let me explain something called the Pearl Index first. So the Pearl Index is like the universal measure of the effectiveness of birth control methods. And the the Pearl Index number is how many out of 100 women, how many of them will get pregnant in one year of using a given method? And so for the IUD, for example, the Pearl Index is like less than one. Um, And that's for both perfect use and typical use. There's always, they always break it down into perfect and typical use for the the Pearl Index. So for the pullout method, the perfect use Pearl Index is actually four. So that means four women out of 100 will get pregnant in a year. That's that's not actually that bad. The condom has a perfect use of two, um, a perfect use Pearl Index of two. Um, typical use for the pullout method is 27. Um, typical use for a condom, just to compare, is 15. And so the pullout method, if used perfectly, is not a bad method. Um, there's better ones, but it's not terrible. It's just that it's hard to do it perfectly. Right, right. You'd have to really, really know um, when you're ovulating, I guess. Well, not necessarily, um, because the, the that perfect use is for pulling out 
among women who weren't tracking their cycle. They, there's no like special specifications in that Pearl Index number that, you know, you only um, can have sex or, you know, during the right time. If you're pulling out even when you're ovulating, um, then it's really hard to get pregnant if you're doing it perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. So can you get pregnant at any time of the month? Um, it depends. Well, no, definitely not. Um, you can only get pregnant during your fertile window during those six days, the five days before ovulation and the day of ovulation itself. I think when I was, um, a teenager or even a young adult, I kind of thought, well, I know there's a certain time of the month when the chances are better, but there's probably this small chance anytime. That's absolutely not the case. Um, the hard thing is you don't know with absolute certainty when ovulation is until after it happens. And so that's why, you know, if you're not tracking your fertility, you never really know exactly where you are in your cycle. And so effectively there's a chance of pregnancy. Um, but you, you really can only get pregnant during your fertile window. And if you know how to track your cycle and how to look at your cervical mucus and other fertility signs, there's times during your cycle when you're, you're very safe from, you're, you know, you're pretty confident that you're not fertile. Um, obviously there's always human error, but if you have say, you know, a 32 day cycle and you know that you typically always ovulate on day 20 or whatever it is, that means that for you, maybe you'll have a shorter cycle some months or a longer cycle other months, but you're probably, it's going to be plus or minus a few days. You're not going to ovulate like on day 13. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. Whenever I talk about, um, like, can you get pregnant any time of the month or things like that? I don't know why, but the quote from Mean Girls always comes to my head that when the teacher's like, don't have sex because you will get pregnant and die. <laughs> I know. I love that. <laughs> I don't know why. It's like every time without fail, it just comes into my head. Well, I think that's because that's what they want high schoolers to think. They don't, or I don't, I'm sure there's no big conspiracy and it's not on purpose, but sometimes I'm like, do they not teach this in high school sex ed? Because they don't want teenagers to know that you can't get pregnant any time right. of the month. Right. I mean, I think I do feel like most people I know were kind of taught you could get pregnant any time. So there's really no safe time to have unprotected sex. And that's the crazy thing, though, is like you spend the majority of your sexual life preventing pregnancy. But then when you want it, you want it now. And it doesn't always happen right away. Right. Because exactly. you're, you're yeah. taught how to prevent it, but you're not, they're not taught, we're not taught like how to get it done. And then there's the, I think there's kind of the wrong expectations because if you worked so hard for so long to avoid it, you're like, wait, mm-hmm. is it really that hard like <laughs> to get pregnant? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so is there any tips that you can do after intercourse that help the sperm stick or can I do a headstand and that's going to help? me get pregnant or anything like that? Not really. So I'll talk about the hip stuff after intercourse thing, because that's a really big one. Um, So there's no evidence that that works. Um, The reason why people talk about that a lot is that there was this one study from the year 2000 where women who had unexplained infertility and were undergoing um, IUI they were, they, there were two groups They were randomized to after this procedure, they either had bed rest for 10 minutes or they just got up and went about their day. And the group that had the 10 minutes of bed rest, um, 29% um, of those women got pregnant compared with only 10% of those who went about their day. So that's a big difference. It was a randomized trial. So that's a, a really good kind of study. Um, but it had nothing to do with elevating their hips and it was IUI, not, you know, regular old sex. And these couples had unexplained infertility. And so we don't know that those findings would apply to the general population. And it certainly doesn't indicate that everyone should raise their hips. I sort of put this into the category of things that definitely can't hurt. And if it's just, you know, makes you feel like it helps, (laughs) then why not just do it? But it probably doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're going to say you said something about the hip stuff after the raising the hips. Okay. So you just kind of like do a bridge. I mean, there's, there's no, there's no like thing that you, there's no recommendation because there's no studies showing that it works is the only thing we know is that for couples who had unexplained infertility, who were undergoing IUI in this one study, the ones who laid down flat on their backs in bed for 10 minutes after had a better pregnancy rate, but we don't know that that would apply 
to, it, yeah. to, you know, fertile couples having sex. And it really doesn't say anything about the raising the hips up. Um, they didn't even look at that in the study. I know that's just, a, I mentioned that because it's very, it's a popular recommendation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I had a friend who they got pregnant on the first time and, and she said that her husband made her do a headstand after. <laughs> oh, a headstand. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's very unlikely that that helped, but, but I'm not against people doing things that, you know, just help, that help their superstitions. Right. Right. All right, everyone, I'm going to tell you about something that Vito and I did, and it only took us 10 minutes, and that is we created a trust and a will online, and it was something that we had been procrastinating to do just because, I don't know, when you hear those words, you kind of don't know where to start, and it sounds like there's so much to do, but trustandwill.com is estate planning simplified. Uh, We went online, they asked us questions and made it super simple for us to fill in and answer, and then they combined everything together, sent us the documents to sign, and it was seriously 10 minutes and so easy. Uh, It starts at $39. They offer guardianships, wills, and trusts in all 50 states. And right now we have an amazing offer for you guys. It's never too early to make a trust or a will. And right now you can take 10% off by going to trustandwill.com slash mamas or entering promo code mamas at trustandwill.com. That's 10% off by going to trustandwill.com slash mamas or entering the promo code mamas at trustandwill.com. Have you heard, um, because I don't know how true this may be and I'm not sure if you know, but so the, the sperm determines whether it drops an X or a Y chromosome and the ones carrying the Y are faster swimmers, but die off earlier, but the X, so the girls are kind of like marathon runners. So the, all of those differences in sperms are true, but what that doesn't mean is that you have any ability to, you know, time intercourse in a way to, um, to, you know, select a certain gender. Like there's been a bunch of studies looking into that and really none of them find that that works. And probably what happens, anyone who's trying to, you know, have sex this many days before for a girl or this many days before for a boy, what they're, what the one thing they are doing is probably lowering their overall chances of getting pregnant because if you're trying to avoid having sex on certain days, then you're just having less sex before ovulation and you have a lower chance of getting pregnant. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, can you, this is also a random thing that some people believe is that it's better to kind of not have sex and let the sperm build up and then have sex so that there's a good, I guess, ejaculation instead of like just having sex every day during the week that you're ovulating. Is there any truth so to that? So for most, for most couples, um, having sex every day or every other day, they both give you about the same chances of getting pregnant. You ha- it's like slightly higher chances if you do it every day, but it's almost negligible and that's hard for a lot of couples. Um, there's really, if, if you have low sperm count, you might want to wait, like not do it every day, do it every other day instead. Um, but you would not want to wait like several days because then the sperm is old and not as good anymore. Hmm. That's so interesting. So your sperm can get old, like in your system? Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert on this. Um, so I, I probably am going to, I'm sure there's like a more technical way to describe it than the sperm gets old. That's right. I'm taking um, a note, old <laughs> sperm <laughs> research. <it>. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but basically that's what, that's what happens. It gets old. It's not as, it's not as potent, if you will. Um, if you, if you wait a super long time. Um, so I, I, I've heard of stories where women are like, telling their partners like don't masturbate like we, we save it for me but no that's it's fine they can they can do that right so i, I want to say that most people believe the opposite is true that it's better to wait and kind of let it build up so you know there's a lot in there but then what's in there is kind of like rusty <laughs> exactly yeah i mean <laughs> it's it's rusty and it's it's not good. Um, <laughs> no, every, every day for for most um, for most men should be fine, or every other day if you're worried. But you can always get a, a sperm test, um, and I and I actually think that that's a good first step for couples who haven't gotten pregnant after you know six months or a year. A lot of times people look at the woman first and they're like, oh, let's test you all up and do all this and all that and see what's wrong with you. 
they assume it's the women, but it's much, it, it, just as often infertility is a um, male factor and a sperm analysis is a much cheaper and less invasive um, a procedure than all of the things they do to look at female fertility. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've heard um, is that it's kind of like an easier option to check the male first because if that's what they find is kind of the problem, it's a completely different way of going about it. Whereas with the woman, it's so much more invasive and uh, yeah, I've just heard like with the woman, it's just so much more of an invasive process. Yeah. And it's kind of silly to, you know, go through this really invasive and difficult process for the woman. And then at the end of all of that annoyance to find out, oh, it was the man and we could have done this in this like slightly unpleasant, but easy and painless procedure at the very beginning of this and saved me all this trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, let's dive into birth control a little bit, because I feel like this is another thing that there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Um, Like we were talking earlier about, you know, you spend so long preventing getting pregnant and then you get off birth control and want to get pregnant right away. So what, what is it really like getting off birth control and then going right into trying to conceive? So, um, I think the biggest thing is that when you're on birth control, you don't know what's normal for you. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're, if you're on, you know, the pill, then you're getting what looks like a very regular 28 day menstrual cycle, that, you know, that's an artificial bleed and not a true menstruation, of course, but then you go off the pill and, um, you know, leaving aside for a moment that it it might take a few months for your cycle to normalize. You also just don't know if you're someone who has a 35 day cycle or a 27 day cycle, you just don't know. And and that makes it hard to know when you're fertile because you have to know what your, um, unique cycle is like. Um, and then I think what, in terms of what to expect, it depends a lot on what kind of birth control you were using. Um, there's a few different categories. So there's, um, there's combined hormone birth control, and this is, um, usually that's just the pill, the classic pill, and that has, um, synthetic forms of progesterone and estrogen in it. Then there's the, um, the progestin only birth control, and that's called the mini pill or the Marina IUD. Um, then there's the copper IUD, which has no hormones. Um, then there's also Depo-Provera. Um, and so Depo-Provera, unlike all the other ones, that delays the return of fertility significantly, like for 10 to 18 months. And that's why doctors don't recommend it for women who want to conceive soon. Then for the other two, that, that combined pill, the classic pill with progestin and estrogen, that one, usually fertility returns in you know one to three months for most women. Um, but for some women, um, I think it's, um, let's see, for, for, I think it's like 40% of women that their very first cycle after the pill might be a little funky. You might not ovulate. You might ovulate, but have a short luteal phase, which is the period of time between when you ovulate and when your next um, period begins. And then it also is possible that for the first like nine to 12 months after going off the pill, your cycles might be longer. Not not that your bleeding is longer, just that the time from one period of bleeding to the next might be longer. That's not, there's no evidence that it reduces your fertility, but that can just be a little annoying if you're trying to get pregnant and you only have a chance every, you know, 35 days as opposed to every 28 days. But, this, but it's not any more significant than that. Um, then for the, um, the progestin only forms of birth control, like the mini pill and the Marina IUD, and also the copper IUD, which has no hormones, fertility should return very quickly for most women after going off of those, like pretty much right away. Um, obviously, like individuals might have different experience, but this, when the studies look at it, they find fertility tends to return very quickly. Yeah. Well, I've heard too with birth control, it also depends on the reason why you got on it. If you got on it just as a form of, um, you know, practicing birth control, basically, that it it's easier for it to come back. But if you got on it because you were having like extreme period symptoms or something crazy, because you already weren't regular or anything like that, that that could affect you differently coming off because those same symptoms might return, causing it to be much harder. Than yeah, well. that's definitely true because the pill can kind of mask hormonal conditions. Another thing that can happen, this actually happened to me, is 
while you're on the pill, you can develop a hormonal condition. So, you know, I went on the birth control pills when I was 16 years old. And in my, in my, I, I think I went off when I was like 28 or something. And in that time, I um, started running marathons and eating really healthy and lost some weight, went off the pill, and I didn't get my period. And it turns out I had something called hypothalamic amenorrhea, um, which is a hormonal condition that can happen when, you know, you lose too much weight or your body's under too much stress, you're exercising too much. Um, And, you know, that had nothing to, it kind of looked like this thing called post-pill amenorrhea because I went off the pill and I didn't get my period, but it actually had nothing to do with that. Um, It was something totally different. Um, So yeah, that can happen to women too. Yeah. All right. So you know how all kids are at some point in your life, you went through a super awkward phase. Well, mine happened to last from first to sixth grade. I would do this super awkward, weird smile. And thanks to my friends and family, a lot of it is captured on video and in photos. But all of that is spread all around and none of it's in the same place. But now I can have it all in one place thanks to Legacy Box. Uh, I use Legacy Box to put a bunch of my high school stuff together. And I literally, I was a huge nerd in high school. So I competed in all these different clubs and in uh, musical theater and all sorts of stuff. And I was, it was the time of my life, but I had so many different videos and there was the old tiny tapes and the VHS tapes. And um, it was hard to get everything in one place, but Legacy Box made it so easy. And it seems like every day there's a new mail-in box service. Um, Super expensive ones, gourmet meals, but Legacy Box is the box service that you actually need. And you guys, it is so perfect for the holidays. Christmas is just around the corner. And this is such an amazing box to give to your parents, your siblings, anybody who has those tapes sitting around collecting dust that you want to watch, but you never really know how to anymore. Send them in to Legacy Box. They send you a sturdy box. They load it up or you load it up with all of your media, videotapes, film reels, pictures, even audio cassettes. You send it in and sit back because Legacy Box will take care of the rest for you. And do not fret about any of the materials that you're sending in. There's a personalized barcode for each thing that you send in and they update you on the progress as they go. Their professional preservation crew digitizes thousands of memories every day right here in the U.S. of A. And there is no middleman involved or mystery as to whereabouts your your photos and videos are at. And you'll get the updates so you know that your nostalgic treasures are getting the best treatment. Your parents took them and now it is up to you to save them. Digitally preserve your old photos and videos before it's too late with Legacy Box. For a limited time, they're offering the listeners a huge discount. Go to LegacyBox.com slash mamas to get 40% off your first order. Save your time and memories. Go to LegacyBox.com slash mamas and save 40%. Uh, What about um, your moods and like how... How are your hormones, I guess, like affected after you get off the pill or after birth control? I'm just saying the pill is in generalized hormonal birth control. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're on hormonal birth control, especially if you're on the combined pill um, that has um, estrogen and um, progestin, uh, that can have, uh, that, that basically suppresses your normal hormonal cycle. So not much is going on. Um, hormonally, like, uh, you know, a lot of women when they're not on birth control just might have, uh, they might find that they experience different kinds of moods at different times in their cycle. There's not like, uh, you know, a rule that, you know, all women feel this way on this day of their cycle and this way on that day of their cycle. But women who are naturally cycling just might notice that they have a particular pattern. And so none of that would happen when you're on the pill. You might experience other, um, mood factors. I know this is very controversial, but there's a lot of research around does the pill cause depression? Um, Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But um, going off the pill, one thing you might experience is that you start to you know, have cyclical mood or other symptoms based on your natural um, hormonal fluctuations throughout your cycle. Um, And that there's really no way to... um, to say, oh, this is what happens to women because everyone experiences those hormonal changes very differently. Yeah, absolutely. And and I feel like 
mine are different every single month as well. Like just, I, I haven't been on birth control in like 16 years and, um, my cycles are very regular, but like one month I will PMS and have horrible cramps. And then the next month I don't feel like I'm PMSing at all and I don't have cramps. And then one month my boobs hurt really bad. And I I feel like just even for me that there, there can't be a one size fits all formula because every single month for me, it's completely different. Totally. And I think that that, um, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think that really it's important to know that the symptoms, both emotional and physical can change from month to month. Because I think what happens to a lot of women when they are trying to get pregnant is they'll have a particular month where they're like, oh, you know, most months my, my nipples hurt on this day, but actually oh, my whole boob hurts. Does that mean I'm pregnant? But like, no, mm-hmm. all of those symptoms are caused by progesterone being high at that point in your cycle and progesterone can cause very variable symptoms from month to month. Um, even symptoms you might never have experienced before. And when you're really looking for things, it can, it can, uh, deceive you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, the first symptoms of pregnancy kind of mirror your symptoms of getting your period, right? Sometimes you're a little, you can be a little bit more tired. Your boobs can be tender you can ache a little bit or your appetite might change. Well, so many of those are similar to first signs of pregnancy, you know? So it's like, I don't know. I can see how frustrating that could be for women who are trying and getting the symptoms, then getting excited and then being disappointed when their period comes. Yeah. I mean, the the symptoms are pretty much exactly the same because they're caused by the exact same hormone. You know, when you're in the days in like, you know, the week before your period is due, progesterone levels are really high. If you're going to go on to get your period, they end up falling. If you're pregnant, they end up continuing to go up and stay high throughout your pregnancy. But if you're too early to take a pregnancy test, then you're also too early to know, is my high progesterone right now due to pregnancy or due to, you know, that I ovulated? Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's no, there's really no conclusive difference in those symptoms and they're caused by the exact same hormone. Right. So even if it's super hard to wait, you know, to see which one it is, it's kind of better because then you're not, I guess, kind of going on the roller coaster of it. But the closer you are, like you were saying earlier, a couple days, like before your period or whatever, to take a pregnancy test, um, you know, like letting yourself wait, because I think that that I could understand like how hard that would be. Because some of the tests are like, you can get it, the you know, take it the first week before you're first missed period or whatever. And I'm sure that people get false negatives through that as well. Oh, definitely they do. Yeah. I mean, I think that I know that there's a lot of women who just like testing absurdly early because it sort of desensitizes them to seeing a negative. And so if that's what you're doing, I think that's, that's totally fine. It's just not really possible to get a positive before a certain point. Right. Right. Yeah, man. I could just see how hard that is though. Like it's such Again, I just feel like from the time that women are little, you're like kind of told you're made to make babies. So from the time we're little girls, you know, it's like, oh, like your job in this world is to grow up and be wives and moms. And I know that that's morphed and changed so much. But, you know, from the time we're little, a lot of women get that vision of, oh, I can't wait to be a mom one day. And then going the majority of your life, preventing it and then being ready for it and waiting for it and it's not coming right away has to be like such an emotional journey of like, wait, this is what I was told I'm meant to do. My body's meant to do like my path in life basically. And I can't fulfill it right now. And just kind of the emotional toll that that takes on you as a woman. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is because we just don't have a cultural narrative around the time that you spend trying to get pregnant. Yeah. Um, and, and it's totally separate from infertility um, I, I, it, so it took me around nine cycles to get pregnant, like including a miscarriage, or sorry, six cycles, but it was nine months because I had a miscarriage in there and it prolonged things. And I remember feeling like I was in this like, weird in-between space that was sort of like shameful and embarrassing. I didn't really want to talk about it. And I learned that in, I think it's Japan, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but there's actually a word for phase of life when a couple is trying to get pregnant. And I love that. I wish that we had that here because- it's, it's just the sort of invisible time and you're not talking to people about it and you kind of think it shouldn't even happen. You think that you should just decide to get pregnant and then you're pregnant, but there's, 
you know, it, it, it takes a while and it, you can try for up to a year before you're formally diagnosed with infertility. And that's a whole year of your life that you're like, what am I doing? And like, why is this taking so long? Right, right. Well, and that should be a full year of having healthy, normal cycles too. If you're not cycling at all, you know, that's probably like a completely different problem. Totally. Yeah. But I mean, I love that. I think that that's, that's why conversations like this are so important for people to listen to because it's normal for people to not get pregnant the first month that they're trying. It's normal for people to have, you know, a few rounds at it to figure out, okay, this is kind of when it's best. Here's what my body's doing. Here's what, what's going on. And, you know, I know, I know so many people who it took them six months to a year to get pregnant and they had those feelings of there's something wrong with my body. There's whatever, you know, and it, that's just not the case there. I, we should invent a word here for that phase. <laughs> we, we really should. Yeah. <laughs> well, man. So I would love to, um, I'd love to touch on the article, uh, about miscarriages and then, um, kind of tell us a little bit about how, uh, that Ava bracelet bracelet helps women track when they're going through this crazy time in their life. Yeah, definitely. So we did a, um, a survey, um, of, it was around 3,500 adult women in the U S and UK, just around their attitudes and experiences around miscarriage. Um, I think the most interesting things we found, um, and the most surprising one was that women still very much blame themselves for miscarriage. And this was also really surprising to me. Younger women were the most likely to blame themselves. And with every age bracket we asked, um, they were less likely. Um, I don't know why that is. Um, women also still misidentify the most common causes of miscarriage. Most of the time it's a chromosomal abnormality and it has nothing to do with anything you did. I feel like every article I read about miscarriage says that, um, and says they're very common and it's not your fault, but, you know, s- still, I think women who are going through it, um, it's, it's when it happens to you, it's, it's hard to remember that. Um, another one. So healthcare providers, um, are, are giving women outdated information about when it's okay to try again. There used to be this belief that you kind of had to take a cycle or three cycles off before you were, you know, safely able to try for a baby again after a miscarriage. But for most miscarriages, that's simply not the case. It's it's safe and in fact beneficial to try again right away if you feel emotionally ready. The chances of getting pregnant and having a healthy full-term pregnancy are higher um, if you conceive in the first six months after a miscarriage. And so in our in our research, we found that three quarters of women said they wanted to try again as soon as they had a miscarriage, but half of them, their doctors told them that they, that they should wait. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, those were the, I thought those were the most interesting findings. That is super interesting. I remember, so I had my mom on and she shared the birth story with me, which was like really cool to hear, but she had had a miscarriage right before she got pregnant with me and she was about 16 weeks along and um, had a miscarriage. And she said that she got pregnant again right away on the next cycle, but like she knew she wasn't supposed to. So she just felt stupid kind of like, how could I get pregnant again right away like this? People are going to think I'm crazy. And that made me think that's probably, you know, if women have shared, oh, I'm pregnant and then they have a miscarriage and then they get pregnant right again, there's somehow that mental thing of like, I guess like assuming what other people are thinking about you, like, oh, this person's crazy. She just had a miscarriage. Now she's pregnant again. When that actually might be the best chance of having a viable pregnancy that's going to carry full term. Yeah, definitely. And I think just there's, there's a lot of shame around this whole topic. Um, and yeah, I think especially among women who have multiple miscarriages, um, and it, it really, it shouldn't be there. Right. No. And, and again, that's why conversations around it are, are so important. And you see tons of that in social media. It kind of has brought communities together around miscarriage and around postpartum, which is really cool to see because you can go on there and read about other people's journeys and see that they've been there and, and having people who are being transparent in those communities is kind of creating that conversation so that these women don't feel alone or, or ashamed in it. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's actually similar in a lot of ways to what we were just talking about around how they're like, you know, we need a word for the phase of life that you spend trying to get pregnant. I think we also need more cultural narratives around you know, miscarriage stories and what happens and what, what, what do you expect after a miscarriage? And when you're pregnant, you know, the whole world comes rushing in with like, this is what you need to buy and this is what you need to plan for and this is what you need to do this week and next week and the week after. But there isn't that same thing for the miscarriage process and the recovery process. And mm -hmm. I think that's what women want when they're going through a miscarriage. They want to know, well, what do I do now? Like you, you kind of just get dropped. You stop going to your doctor's appointments and people don't know what to say to you, but that's when you really need the most support. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know like, I don't know, there are certain beliefs too around telling people you're pregnant in the first trimester or not. Like if people announce it super early, people are like, oh, they shouldn't announce it yet because you have a chance of having a miscarriage. And I'm like, who cares? Like then if they do have a miscarriage, then people know what they're going through and they're not going to be like, oh, how, you know, asking questions that, that are ignorant to that couple and, and them feeling really bad about it. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think that obviously people have a right to keep information yeah. private, but mm -hmm. anyone who you would want to support you is it's fine to tell them too. Yeah. I, it's just totally up to that couple and there shouldn't be any judgment surrounding that. I mean, I'm sure some people who have been trying a long time and finally got pregnant are so excited and they share it right away. Like awesome. Good for them. You know, it's not when it's your birth, you can decide. <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny. Like when when I was pregnant with my son, I waited like as long as possible to tell everyone. Like I didn't tell all my work until I was like 21 weeks or something. And I, I think when I get pregnant again, I'm just gonna like day after I get the positive test, just <laughs> tell everyone. <laughs> hey, guess what? Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'd love to hear how um, the Ava bracelet helps with women who are tracking their cycles. Um, yeah. So, uh, so Ava is a sensor bracelet. You wear it only when you're sleeping. A lot of people are like, Oh, do I have to wear this all day? And everyone's going to be like, what's that? It's my pregnancy bracelet. No, um, you only wear it when you're sleeping, um, because it's looking for your physiological parameters and how they're behaving when your body is fully at rest. We have done a couple of studies that look at how, um, things like resting heart rate, temperature, breathing rate, heart rate variability, perfusion, how these change depending on where you are in your menstrual cycle. Um, and looking at all of these factors together with our machine learning algorithm, we're able to, or Ava is able to detect when the beginning of your fertile window occurs in real time. Um, and so that means that know, you're like going through your menstrual cycle and you want to know, I, I was talking earlier about the problem with ovulation tests that they only tell you about 24 hours before you're going to ovulate when some of your most fertile days might already be behind you. So Ava kind of solved that problem by telling you, okay, your fertile window just opened. So now is the time you have, you know, five days ahead of you that are the time to really prioritize having sex. Um, and it does this all in a way that I think it doesn't ask too much of the user. One thing that uh, I've thought a lot about is how much more work, um, you know, mental and physical labor women do around fertility. I, we did a survey once among our users and said, you know, how much time a week do you spend thinking about getting pregnant and researching it and worrying about it compared to your partner? I don't remember the results, but we, women did something like, you know, 10 times as much. Mm -hmm. um, so, so women do enough work around these things already. You shouldn't have to have this like second full-time job around you know, tracking all of this stuff and waking up early to take your temperature. And you know, I'm a big proponent of checking your cervical mucus. I think it's so fascinating. But if you don't want to do that, you shouldn't have to. Um, and so Ava takes that work away. You just put the bracelet on at night, wake up, sink, and it tells you this is what's going on with your fertility. Yeah. And how is it, I guess, super beneficial to women who aren't trying to get pregnant? Ah, uh, yes. Well, I think that um, it's, it's really important that women understand that their fertility and their menstrual cycle isn't just something that's there in a vacuum and, you know, the only purpose is when you want to get pregnant. Um, it has major implications for your overall health. Um, it's really important that you have a regular menstrual cycle with regular ovulation um, because of things like um, you know, get, getting that, that regular dose of estrogen and progesterone each month. Um, 
impacts your long-term risk for heart disease, for osteoporosis, for dementia. It impacts your mood, your skin, your hair, um, how you feel on a day-to-day basis, your energy levels. And if there's something off about your cycle, then you would want to know. It it doesn't just matter for your fertility. Um, So yeah, I think it's important for all women to know this stuff. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more because it's... I had a conversation with this lady and I loved her view kind of on the menstrual cycle. And she said, doctors should look at that as like a fifth vital sign of your health because it tells you so much about yourself. And we're kind of, kind of just completely oblivious to it. Like I get my period every month. Sometimes my boobs hurt. Sometimes this happens and that's it where it's like, there's so many other things that our cycles are telling us about our health that could be, really help us out in the long run if we knew about it now. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's, it's shocking to me how many, um, people even in the medical profession don't realize that. Like I mentioned earlier that I had this thing called hypothalamic amenorrhea where I was exercising too much and my, my whole menstrual cycle basically disappeared. And I talked to my gynecologist about it and he said, Oh, you're not trying to get pregnant right now. Like you're so healthy. You're a runner. This is not a big deal. Like just, it's fine. If you want to get your period, go in the pill. And I I did my own research and found out that was absolutely, you know, the worst possible advice and not getting my period um, when I wasn't on the pill meant I was increasing my risk for all of these really bad things. And I needed to like, like immediately stop exercising and gain weight. And then my period came back and I feel so, you know, outraged that, that a medical person told me that. Yeah. Well, I, like you were saying before, I feel like a lot of information out there is kind of outdated because it kind of has, periods are kind of treated as, a symptom instead of like a part of us. Like it's just a sign that I have a cycle every month is that I get my period. Like and it's just a, a symptom of being a woman almost instead of this is there for a reason. It's there to help you, to um, help your body carry life, to tell you things about your health. And I mean, anytime I've gone, I've been... I've dealt with stuff before with my ovaries a few times being in so much pain. I used to be killed over in pain and I would be spotting and I've had two transvaginal ultrasounds done and I've had like in every time when nothing was found and, and thankfully that hasn't happened in a long time. But anytime I've gone to the doctor with any of these problems, the solution was always to get on birth control and I'm not opposed to birth control at all. Uh, but for me, it wasn't right at the time because I'm like, well, if something's going on, I don't want to just cover the symptom up. I want to figure out what's going on with my body and and learn what, like, why this is happening. I don't want it just to magically go away. Um, but I also know for so many people who deal with super painful cycles and different things like that, the pill has been the only thing that has helped them with that. And I'm not I'm not saying I'm against birth control before people get outraged or <laughs> like <laughs> anti it or anything like that. Just for me, it, it wasn't an option at the time, but it was, you know, it was just, it, I found out it was linked to something else in my health and I ended up having a thyroid problem. And, um, but that wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known that and been able to deal with that years ago if I had just gotten on the pill at the time. Yeah. And I mean, women need more options. Like I, I feel the same way as you do about the pill that for some women, like with endometriosis, for example, or other mm-hmm. things, the pill is really the best available treatment for certain women in certain situations. Um, but the pill also has downsides and there should be better options for women who don't want to deal with those downsides. Um, and, and there, there aren't always those better options. Right. Right. Yeah. I think just always stay curious and ask tons of questions, like ask your doctor, okay, like, is this going to, like, what are the side effects? What are the risks? How is this going to affect what's going on in my body? Or how is this going to tell me more information about my body? And just be curious and, like, seek out solutions uh, for yourself. Uh, it's, yeah, it's- definitely. And I, I mean, I think the last thing about this whole fifth vital sign business, and I love that phrase, is that women are really lucky to have a menstrual cycle because it's kind of can be the canary in a coal mine for a lot of different um, health issues, Uh, health issues that, you know, men might experience too, but they don't have this this monthly menstrual cycle to cue them off or tip them off that something might be going on. So, so we're really lucky to have that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, One other quick question. So Ava started in Switzerland in, in Zurich. Yes. Okay. I may be going there this summer. And if I oh do, my God. 
I will have to go check it out. (laughs) Yes. Switzerland's my favorite place in the world. I hope you go to the Alps. It's, It's just like unreal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not for sure yet. There's a lot of things pending, but but if I do, I'm like, oh, I should go check out the the Eva place there. Um, yes, you you should come visit in Switzerland. I'm sure everybody would would love to have you. Yeah, that'd be so much fun. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for for coming on and sharing all this information with us. If people want to follow along, what you're doing or what Ava's doing, where can they find out more information? Um, you can find out more at avawomen.com. And if you want to see um, all of the articles about female reproductive health and fertility that I write, you can check that out at avawomen.com slash avaworld. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Thanks for having me. I feel like I learned so much. I've never heard of old sperm before. Have you guys heard of old sperm? I didn't know that was a thing, but it makes total sense. I am so grateful for Lindsay for coming on and teaching us and giving us more information about our bodies and things we can do and questions to ask our providers and things to research for ourselves. I am excited for this next week. We have Dr. Axe coming on to talk about men's health and some of the biggest things facing men these days. And of course, we'll dive into a little bit of reproductive health again. It is fertility month. It's November and yeah, I'm just stoked right now on everything that I'm learning. It is so much fun. Again, if you guys aren't following the Instagram or Twitter, you're going to want to follow us there to stay up to date on the information for the guests, any links that we share here as well. And also, if you're not part of our Miraculous Mamas community, you're going to want to join that. Uh, I also finally released my video series that I'm starting, and it's all about preparing your body to try to conceive. I've been on this path for the last six months. And I'm just so excited to be sharing with you guys all the things that I've learned. It's information from the experts and guests that we've had on and extensive research I've done kind of all compiled into one place for you. And there's going to be resources and links and all of that on there. There's a couple of videos up right now and I'll be posting them on my YouTube channel and on my Instagram account. So if you guys are looking where to find that, if you go to my Instagram, eSandos, you will find links on the IGTV there for you guys. I also just want to let you know that I love you and I appreciate you so much. Our community is awesome and I love when you guys send me questions or let me know something that you learned or something that a guest said that just blew your mind or helped you out um, or inspired you. It's so cool to hear that information. And it's so fueling to know that you guys are loving the education that these guests are bringing and the information that they are teaching us because it just shows that we are growing together as a community, that we are growing in our own ways, that we are just kind of establishing Um, for ourselves and for the future generations, the empowerment of education and having the tools and resources at our fingertips and actually taking action steps on them. And it is just so, so inspiring when you guys reach out to me and, and when I hear from you. So thank you so much to, to the listeners who take the time to do that. It really, really means a lot. I love you guys so much and I cannot wait for you guys to hear the episode next week. I'll talk to you soon. This podcast is brought to you by Wave Podcast Network. Check out all of our shows, including the Brain Candy Podcast, I Don't Get It, Coffee Convos, and Let's Talk About It.